coming. Maybe what I'll do is I will start by sharing my screen. All right, we have that. Walden, you can see uh, that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right, uh, I got people coming in. Okay, welcome to the Department of Sociology speaker series. My name is Ken Kane. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and the organizer of this year's and last year's speaker event. It's a real pleasure to introduce and to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Walden Bello. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the land and the territory upon which our university and city benefits, and then let you know a little bit more about our speakers um, in the new year series. The University of Alberta is home to diverse, thank you, Sarah, uh, to a diverse and welcoming community of over 1,000 Indigenous students from across the country. And Edmonton has the second largest Indigenous population of any city in Canada. We celebrate our Indigenous heritage, including the ancestral lands on which our university is located today. To acknowledge the traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, reaching beyond colonization and the establishment of European colonies, as well as its, its significance for the Indigenous people who live and continued, lived and continue to live in this territory and upon whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the land and other inhabitants today. And so we respectfully acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Nakoda Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures influence our vibrant community. Our department is involved in a number of activities and programs that extend this land acknowledgement to incorporate decolonization, reconciliation, and indigenization into our sociological work. The theme of our speaker series is nature and the social, which broadly encompasses the many ways that the social sciences and humanities explore, understand, challenge, and practice this complex notion of nature. This theme will be further explored in our January 21st event where Dr. Leela Harris from the University of British Columbia will be giving a talk entitled Human Right to Water and Ongoing Challenges, Equity, Uneven Implementation and Shifting State Society Relations. Following that, Dr. Afua Cooper from Dalhousie University will be speaking on February 17th, followed by Kerry Norgard from the University of Oregon on March 4th. Stay tuned for details on these, uh, on these uh, sociology speaker events, uh, series events. But today our speaker is Dr. Walden Bello coming to us from Manila in the Philippines. Dr. Bello's talk is entitled Post Neoliberalism or Neoliberalism's Second Act. Dr. Dr. Bello is a sociologist, activist and former member of the House of Represent Representatives of the Republic of the Philippines. Dr. Bello is international adjunct professor at New York University at Binghamton and co-chair of the prominent Bangkok-based activist think tank Focus on the Global South. He's the author of or co-author of 25 books and numerous articles and research monographs. After contributing to the ouster of the strongman Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines, Dr. Bello played a key role in the rise of the anti-globalization movement with his writings and activism against the World uh, Trade Organization, World Bank and IMF. He is a leader of the human rights movement against Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte. He was the recipient of the 2003 Right Livelihood Award, referred to as the Alternative Nobel Prize, for his work on corporate-driven globalization and was named Outstanding Public Scholar by the International Studies Association in 2008. Dr. Bello was active in parliamentary politics where he was a member of the Philippines House of Representatives from 2009 to 2015 heading up that institution, institution's committee on overseas workers affairs. Walden Bellow's recent work has focused on the rise of counter-revolutionary movements globally, the East Asian developmental state and the global financial system. He has also written on the challenges to democracy and the rise of China as a global economic and political power. His most recent works are the 2019 book, Counter-Revolution, The Global Rise of the Far Right, and the, the 2019 book, Paper Dragons, China and the Next Crash. 
We'll have time for questions and discussion following Dr. Bellow's talk. At that time, you can use either the raise hand button next to your name to indicate that you have a question to ask, or you can use the chat function um, to ask a text-based question that uh, Dr. Sarah Doro and I can then present to Dr. Bellow. Dr. Bellow has kindly agreed to allow us to record this talk. And so we'll post the recorded talk on Google Drive. The link to this recording will be on our departmental, uh, Department of Sociology website in the next day or so. So you'll know where to access that. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bellow to the University of Alberta and the Department of Sociology speakers series. Dr. Bellow. Okay. Uh... Well, uh, thank you very much again. Uh, good morning. I am joining you from Manila, where it is at 10 a.m. Uh, on November uh, 25. Um, well, let me first of all thank uh, Professor uh, Kane and other organizers of this online event. And to all of those present today, I would like to say I'm I am happy to be with all of you. The COVID-19 pandemic is the second major crisis of globalization in a decade. The first was the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, from which the global economy took years to reach a semblance of recovery. We did not learn our lessons from the first, and this is perhaps why the impact of the second has been even more massive. A trillions of dollars of paper wealth went up in smoke during the 2008 crisis, but few cried for the out of control financial players who had triggered the crisis. More serious were the impacts on the real economy. Tens of millions of people lost their jobs with 25 million in China alone in the second half of 2008. Air cargo plunged 20% in one year. Global supply chains, many of whose links were in China, were severely disrupted. The Economist lamented that, quote, the integration of the world economy is in retreat on almost every front, unquote. Adding that, quote, some critics of capitalism seem happy about it, like Walden Bellow, a Philippine economist, who can perhaps claim to have coined the word deglobalization with his book, Deglobalization, Ideas for a New World Economy. Thank you, economists, for the special mention. But contrary to the economists' fears and to our dismay, all were brushed aside after the deaths of the recession in 2009, and there was a return to business as usual. Though the world entered what orthodox economists called a phase of, quote, secular stagnation, unquote, or low growth with continuing high unemployment, export-oriented production via global supply chains and world trade resumed their forward march. In China, most of the $585 billion stimulus earmarked for social spending by the government amidst the crisis was hijacked by the dominant export lobby, which channeled the funds to the enterprises and local governments of the eastern and southeastern coasts of the country that had become the center of a global Sinocentric division of labor in manufacturing industries. Carbon emissions had decelerated in the depths of the crisis, but they now resumed their upward trend air cargo traffic rebounded and air travel grew even more spectacularly. After declining by 1.2% in 2009, air travel grew annually by an average of 6.5% between 2010 and 2019. Quote, unquote, connectivity in transport, particularly air transport was supposed to be the key to successful globalization. As the Director General of the powerful International Air Transport Association put it, and I quote, dampening demand for air connectivity risks high quality jobs and economic activity dependent on global mobility. Governments must understand that globalization has made our world more socially and economically prosperous. Inhibiting globalization with protectionism will see opportunities lost, unquote. 
Aside from the desire to speed up the flow of commodities through global supply chains, the demand for air connectivity was fueled by the desire of the global airline industry to cash in on the explosion of outbound Chinese tourism. In 2018, Chinese made 149 million overseas trips, a figure that exceeded those of other countries, including the United States. Not only the airlines, but large parts of the service sector of many countries became dependent on the massive inflow of Chinese tourists who spent over $130 billion overseas in 2018. In Thailand alone, the country most visited by Chinese tourists, over 11, 11 million of whom came in 2019, tourism account, accounted for a whopping 20% of gross domestic product. Globalization may have recovered somewhat, but the financial crisis and the global stagnation that followed cost it dearly in terms of its legitimacy, especially in the United States and Europe, where movements of the right took advantage of the situation to advance economic nationalist agenda, a development we shall touch on later. China, meanwhile, took advantage of the West's retreat into economic nationalism and isolationism by promoting itself as, as the new champion of globalization. At Davos in January 2017, President Xi Jinping warned, and I quote, the global economy is the big ocean you cannot escape from, unquote, in which China had, quote, learned to swim, unquote. He called on world political and corporate leaders to quote, adapt to and guide globalization, cushion its ne negative impacts and deliver its benefits to all countries and all nations. More than this, C offered to back up his words with a trillion dollar mega program, the Belt and Road Initiative that evoked the fabled silk routes through which trade between China and Europe was carried out in early modern times. This ambitious program consisting of dam building, road and rail construction, setting up coal plants and extractive ventures was geared to promote what Beijing called quote, global connectivity, unquote. Originally meant to link Asia to Europe, BRI was opened up to every country on earth in 2015 so that there was no longer one belt and one road, but multiple routes, including a quote, polar silk route. While the pro-globalization clack clapped, others were more skeptical. Some saw the whole thing as simply a way to export the surplus capacity problem dogging Chinese heavy industry by lassoing countries with loans into massive capital intensive projects. Focus on the Global South described BRI as quote, an anachronistic, anachronistic transference to the 21st century of the technocratic state socialist and developmentalist mindset that produced the Hoover Dam in the US, the massive construction dams in Stalin's Soviet Union, the Three Gorges Dam in China, the Narmada Dam in India, and the Namtyun II Dam in Laos. They are testaments to what Arundhati Roy has called modernity's disease of gigantism. In 2019, despite a worsening trade war between China and the United States, there still seemed to be no alternative to globalization. Tina, or there is no alternative, Margaret Thatcher's notorious law, still seemed to hold. Despite rising production costs, China was chugging along, the undisputed workshop of the world owing to greater connectivity with the rest of the world. More and more countries were buying into BRI's promise of connectivity. Air travel was booming with corporate executives, government officials, NGO top brass brought closer together by connectivity, which also brought exponentially increasing Chinese tourists to all parts of the world, making lost local destinations happy and asking for more. Then the virus. Air connectivity becomes the medium for the transmission of a virus that seemed to move at internet speed. The global economy grinds to a halt, not only because of lockdowns to stop the virus, but also because China's production lines stop, exposing the folly of having supply chains based on the principle of locating them where the unit costs of production are lowest. 
which is the raison d'etre of globalization. The cost of subcontracting so much production to China are painfully revealed in the essential medical equipment like COVID-19 test kits, syringes, even face masks in the United States and Europe, not to say the rest of the pandemic stricken world. Meanwhile, the global and regional agricultural supply chains that had put so many local farmers out of business faced disruptions as migrant workers faced COVID-19 induced barriers to travel to harvest crops and commodities halted land, sea, and air transport for fear the latter would spread the virus among them. Yet, if there's any silver lining to this tragedy, it is perhaps that it has happened today rather than later, when the BRI might well have even more fatal consequences. As Sonia Shah recently pointed out in The Nation, viruses leap being, leaping from their animal hosts to whom they bring no harm to humans, to whom they do, has become increasingly frequent because humans are invading the habitats of wildlife by cutting down forests as well as climate change. 60% of microbial pathogens that have emerged over the last few decades come from animals and two thirds of these from wildlife. The World Wildlife Federation points out that BRI will negatively impact on 1,700 biodiversity hotspots and about 265 species that are already at risk. Among the animals that face possible extinction or habitat destabilization from BRI are the rare Tanapuli orangutan, Sumatra tiger, Sunta pangolin, white winged flying fox, slender tailed cloud rat, rare chivet cats, Philippine eagle, and Philippine deer. Most of these animals serve as hosts to species leading viruses like the novel coronavirus. What is often overlooked is the so-called revenge of wildlife to the disruption of their living quarters. Viruses leaping from their hosts to humans is one of the forms of blowback. There are others. According to one study published in Current Biology, BRI's network of roads, railways, and pipelines could introduce more than 800 alien invasive species, including 98 amphibians, 177 reptiles, 391 birds, and 150 mammals into several countries along its many routes and developments, destabilizing their economic ecosystems. As shown in innumerable times, nature has a way of punishing those that disrupt living arrangements that have existed for eons. And the irony is that humans, through processes like globalization and connectivity, help facilitate this blowback. Should it continue, the blowback from BRI could well be more severe than COVID-19. But let us go back to the main theme. The 2008 financial crisis failed to put an end to globalization. Instead, a new phase of globalization connectivity emerged with China providing the political leadership and economic clout. That phase has now ended. As countries put up barriers to the travel of people and the transport of goods and global supply chains are either voluntarily or de facto dismantled, the big question is what will replace globalization connectivity as a new paradigm? Crises do not always result in significant change. It is the interaction of or synergy between two elements, an objective one, meaning a systemic crisis, and a subjective one, that is, the people's psychological response to it that is decisive. The global financial crisis of 2008 was a profound crisis of capitalism, but the subjective element, popular alienation from the system, had not yet reached a critical mass. Owing to the boom created by debt finance, consumer spending over two decades, people were shocked by the crisis, but they were not alienated. That alienated from the system during the crisis and its immediate aftermath. Things are different today. The level of discontent and alienation with neoliberalism was already very high in the global north before the coronavirus hit, owing to the established elite's inability to reverse the decline in living standards and skyrocketing inequality in the dreary decade that followed the financial crisis. 
In the United States, the period was summed up in the popular mind as one where the elites prioritized saving the big banks over saving millions of bankrupt homeowners and ending large-scale unemployment, while in much of Europe, especially in Southern and Eastern Europe, the people's experience of the last decade was captured in one word, austerity. And in much of the global South, the chronic crisis of underdevelopment under the peripheral peripheral capitalism exacerbated by neoliberal reforms since the 1980s had already shredded the legitimacy of key institutions of globalization like the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and the World Trade Organization even before the 2008 crisis. The coronavirus pandemic of 2020, in short, roared through an already destabilized global economic system, suffering from a deep crisis of legitimacy. The sense that things had run out of control, certainly out of the control of the traditional political and economic managers, was the first shocking realization. The mass perception of astonishing elite incompetence is now connecting to the already deep-seated feelings of resentment and anger boiling over from the post financial crisis period. So the subjective element, the psychological critical mass is there. It is a whirlwind that is waiting to be captured by contending political forces. The question is who will succeed in harnessing it? The global establishment will of course try to bring back the so-called old normal, a return to which we will later return. But there's simply too much anger, too much resentment, too much insecurity that have been unleashed. And there's no forcing the genie back into the bottle. Though for the most part falling short of expectations, the massive fiscal and monetary interventions of capitalist states earlier this year have underlined to people what is possible under another system with different priorities and values. Neoliberalism is dying. It's only a question if its passing will be swift or slow, as Danny Roderick characterizes it. Who will ride the tiger? Only the left and the right are, in my view, serious contenders in this race to bring about another system. Progressives have come up with a number of exciting ideas and paradigms developed over the last few decades for how to move swiftly towards a truly systemic transformation and this go beyond the left-wing technocratic Keynesianism identified with Joseph Stiglitz and Paul Krugman. Among these truly radical alternatives are the Green New Deal, democratic socialism, degrowth, deglobalization, ecofeminism, food sovereignty, and buen vivir, or living well. The problem is these strategies have not yet been translated into a critical mass on the ground. The usual explanation for this is that people are, quote, not ready for them, end quote. But probably more significant as an explanation is that most people still associate these dynamic streams of the left with the center left. On the ground where it matters, the masses cannot yet distinguish these strategies and their advocates from the social Democrats in Europe and the Democratic Party in the United States that were implicated in the discredited neoliberal system to which they had sought to provide a quote, progressive face. For large numbers of citizens, the face of the left is still the Social Democratic Party in Germany, the Socialist Party in France, the Democratic Party in the United States, and their records are hardly inspiring to say the least. In the Global South, leadership of and participation in liberal democratic governments also led to left-wing parties being discredited when these coalitions adopted neoliberal measures that came under the rubric of structural adjustment, even as the so-called pink tide in Latin America ran into its own contradictions and communist states in East Asia became state capitalist systems with a strong dose of neoliberalism. Once seen as a break with the past, the concert as shown in Chile, Workers' Party in Brazil, Chavismo in Venezuela, and the so-called Beijing consensus are now seen as part of that past. In short, the center-left's thoroughgoing compromise with neoliberalism in the North, along with progressive parties and states, along with it, not actively uh, going with, uh, if not actively adopting neoliberal measures in the South, tarnish the progressive spectrum as a whole. 
even though it was from the non-mainstream, non-state left that the critique of neoliberalism and globalization initially issued in the 1990s and 2000s. It is a dark legacy that must be decisively pushed aside if progressives are to connect and with and transform into a positive liberating force the mass anger and resentment that are now boiling over. Unfortunately, it is the extreme right that is currently best positioned to take advantage of the global discontent because even before the pandemic, extreme right parties were already opportunistically cherry picking elements of the anti-neoliberal stands and programs of the independent left, for instance, the critique of globalization, the expansion of the welfare state, and greater in state intervention in the economy, but putting them within a right-wing gestalt. So in Europe, you had radical parties, among them Marine Le Pen's National Front in France, the Danish People's Party, the Freedom Party in Austria, Viktor Orban's Fidesz Party in Hungary, abandoning parts of the old neoliberal program, advocating liberalization and less taxation, that they had supported and were now proclaiming that they were for the welfare state or for more protection of the economy from international engagements, but exclusively for, for the benefit of people with quote, the right skin color, the right culture, the right ethnic stuff, the right religion. Essentially, it's the old national socialist class inclusivist, but racially and culturally exclusivist formula whose consummate practitioner at present is Donald Trump. Unfortunately, it works in our troubled times, as shown by the unexpected string of electoral successes of the far right that have pirated large sectors of social democracy's working class base. Meanwhile, in the global South, charismatic leaders with cross-class appeal like Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines and Narendra Modi in India, harness for their authoritarian projects the popular discontent with longtime liberal democratic regimes whose severely unequal, unequal social structures belied their democratic pretensions, sidelining progressive parties that had either compromised with neoliberalism, were imprisoned in classist paradigms that failed to understand the new populist realities or were debilitated by sectarian feuds. Now, using the coronavirus as an excuse, these authoritarian personalities have tightened their repressive hold on the political system with extremely high levels of mass approval of their measures. Though the incompetent responses to the virus may have dented this popularity to some degree. But one would be foolish to count out the left. History has a complex dialectical movement, and there are unexpected developments that open up opportunities for those both bold enough to seize them, think outside the box, and are willing to ride the tiger on its unpredictable route to power, of which there are many on the left, especially among the younger generation. This brings us to the situation in the United States, which is more fluid today than it has been in years. The abominable killing of George Floyd brought a diverse movement of people to the streets under the political leadership of Black Lives Matter. What amounted to an unarmed uprising against the police throughout the country appeared to give the broad left the momentum in national politics, though the Democratic Party base voted to have a so-called safe centrist as its candidate in the November elections. But just as one must not count out the left, one must not count out the right. President Trump responded to the left's cry for racial justice with a blazing call for law and order to contain what he depicted as a mayhem on the streets. This was in reality a racially coded message that appealed to the white community's primordial prejudices against blacks. This counterattack culminated in Trump's speech at the Republican National Convention in August. It is important to study that speech for what it was, for it was not the usual wild ranting by Trump, but a carefully crafted speech that was the quintessential distillation of the ideology of the new American far right. 
Personalized as an attack on Biden, its main theme was a coded ra racist message, what Americans call a dog whistle, masquerading as a demand for law and order in the face of those like Biden who allegedly tolerated and abetted crime. In addition, Biden was depicted as a Trojan horse for socialism. Biden was said to have sold US workers down the river by voting for NAFTA and China's entry into the WTO. Biden was the candidate of China, the US's main rival. Biden was the candidate of illegal immigrants. Biden represented all of those who depreciated and ridiculed America's traditional values. The speech climaxed with a preen to the ideology of American exceptionalism, celebrating its so-called rugged individualism exemplified by its white pioneers that conquer, conquered everything in their way. Well, the US elections are over and throughout the world, there has been a sign of relief at the results. But for me, what is most striking about these elections is that 47.3% of the electorate voted for Trump despite his awful mismanagement of the pandemic, his lies, his anti-science attitude, his divisiveness, and his blatant pandering to white nationalist groups like the Nazis, clans, Klan, and Proud Boys. And indeed, Trump gathered 10 million more votes in this election than in 2016. Whites make up around 65% of the electorate in the United States. Surveys show that 57% of white voters, 56% women and 58% men went for Trump, despite everything, his awful mismanagement of the pandemic, et cetera. The electoral coalition that was behind Biden's win was a minority of whites, 42%, most likely the people with more years in school, the vast majority of black voters, 87%, and the big majority of Latino, Latina voters, 66%, and Asian American voters, 63%. Trump's support among whites was essentially the same as in 2016, with that of women rising to make up for a slight decline in that of men. Even before Trump, support for the Republican Party was already overwhelmingly white. White solidarity is on the ascent and more than opposition to taxes, opposition to abortion, and unqualified defense of the market, it is now the defining ideology of the Republican Party. What Trump has managed over the last few years as president is not so much to transform an already racially polarized electoral arena, but to mobilize his racist base ex elect extra electorally through six years of nonstop ideological campaigning combining the dog whistle race coded language with rhetorical attacks on big tech and Wall Street. That is where the danger lies now, the fascist mobilization of a white population that is in relative decline numbers wise in the face of its electoral failure. What will the results of the US elections make mean for our thesis that neoliberals and globalists are a spent force and that the future will see mainly a contention between the left and the right. I think that especially with so many neoliberals and neoconservatives deserting Trump and the Republican Party, at least momentarily, and supporting Biden, and with the people surrounding Biden coming mainly from the Clinton-Obama wing of the Democratic Party that is friendly with high finance and big tech, a Biden presidency will hew politically to the center and in terms of economic policy, seek to recharge ne globalization and neoliberalism, especially to cater to demands of both Silicon Valley and Wall Street. But as Marx said, history first occurs as tragedy then as farce. My sense is that owing to the erosion of credibility of globalization and neoliberalism, the return to an anachronistic centrism will not hold and will serve at best as an extremely unstable, short-lived interregnum amidst deepening polarization between left and right. In this struggle, the far right is at this point far more united politically and ideologically than the left under the leadership of a charismatic personality who, while he lost the elections, will continue to be a dominant figure after the elections. The question that I would like to end with is having helped save the election 
for a centrist neoliberal leaning candidate, how will the left respond to the formidable challenge from the right in the next few years? The winner of this um, struggle is not foreordained. Uh, so thank you very much for um, um, for giving me your attention over the last few minutes. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Bello. So, whoops, I'm just going to try to. Okay, so, um, so thank you very much. We, Sarah? Can, could you stop sharing your screen so that we can yes. see? Yes. Thank you. can't seem just to give me a minute here. Hmm. There we go. How is that? Yes, it's okay, okay with me. Good. Okay, so once again, thank you so much, Dr. Bello. That um, for for that wonderful uh, talk, I think it gave us a lot to think about. As as you were talking, I was thinking a lot about these uh, these movements from progressives like the uh, degrowth, deglobalization, and other and other organizations and, and movements like this that that made me think a lot about where um, opportunities lie. So with that, um, I want to open it up to questions or any uh, you know further discussion. Uh, with with Dr. Bello. So again, I'll just remind you that if you have a question, you can raise your hand um, <coughs> using your uh, name on the right hand side, or you can ask a question in the chat section, and we can interpret that for repeat that. Sorry for Dr. Bello. So do we do we have any questions, Sarah? Not so far. Oh, Sir Ryan has his hand up. Sir Ryan, why don't you go ahead? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Bello, for a, a very engaging and uh, informative talk. And I, uh, I very much do agree with your uh, assessment about that we will see a, a great, greater polarization and an intensifying uh, conflict between the left and the right uh, post pandemic. In that regard, and in, in, in terms of just my, every time I try to think about where we're headed in this way, I, I just lead, I just end up thinking more and more in terms of war. But um, the question I wanted to ask you was about uh, the, the progressive international uh, project that Yanis Varoufakis and other people in Europe have started out, and what your thoughts are on its prospect of being able to really uh, uh, be something that works internationally rather than being centered in Europe? Well, um, I certainly commend the Euro-based organizers for reaching out to us in the Global South. Um, they have actively encouraged, for instance, um, Focus on the Global South, which is the Bangkok-based organization that I am the co-founder of uh, to join in, and um, you know certainly there's um, uh, you know they're very open to you know diverse movements and diverse views, um, uh, and the common factor, of course, being you know uh, you know an opposition to to neoliberalism. Uh, to the rise of the authoritarian right, and uh, a real uh, um, and for a, a really big push uh, on uh, eliminating inequality, as well as taking real effective steps against climate change. So, I think it's a really good um, project, uh, but. My sense is um, it has to be able to surmount the problem that has faced so many uh, 
movements in the South over the last, in, the, in, 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 in both the global North and the South, um, which is, you know, how do you translate your ideas into a mass base? Uh, and not just to be a force during elections, uh, but in terms of being a force that can impact on local, regional, and national politics. And I think that is uh, really the, you know, the, the most, you know, the, the challenge for uh, progressives and the left at this uh, point in time. Um, I don't think we must underestimate the uh, impact in terms of visions for change, uh, um, you know, that um, was created, a very negative impact that was created by the collapse of the socialist states in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Um, uh, Thomas Piketty in his last book, um, uh, Capitalism and Ideology, in fact, places a lot of emphasis on this. And I agree with him, you know, that uh, we still have to get out of the way that the collapse of uh, state-oriented socialism had uh, in terms of people being receptive again to uh, socialist oriented or participatory socialist oriented ideas to democratic socialism as you might call it i mean this whole range you know uh, of alternatives that um, are being offered at this point whether or not they use the word socialist or not so there's that uh, ideological sort of mountain that we do need to be able to conquer. Um, so in one sense, the difference between movements, say in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, where there was, whether you call it social democracy or communism, and there was this vision uh, that people had a lot of confidence in that it would bring about a new world Unfortunately, now, post-1989, uh, despite you know, the crisis that neoliberalism itself is undergoing, um, you know, taking that step you know, for a lot of people from being disgusted or resentful of neoliberalism to taking on the positive steps of really embracing a progressive alternative um, that still has to be really done, and 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 so I I, I think that um, I I I think that uh, as much as an organizing question, um, as much as being able to offer ideas. Um, progressives must be able again to offer inspiration. And I, I, and I think, you know, that is um, uh, what is largely missing at this point and is the big barrier between ideas and ideas becoming a critical mass on the ground. So that's a rather long answer to your question, but it was a very, very important question that that you raised. And I, I think that many of the people joining Progressive International are very much aware of these issues. And, you know, that it's not going to be an easy uh, kind of process to come back uh, to, in fact, become a, a critical mass on the ground that will be able to affect policies. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sarai, for that great question. Um, I have another question from Minel Shavastava, if you'd like to go ahead. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Bello, for a very insightful presentation. Um, 
I have a question about, it's it sort of, you've answered some of it, but I, I was still wondering if you could elaborate on the prospect of the progressive or left course, uh, uh, forces being a little bit more organized or being able to mobilize more uh, public support. Um, and the reason I'm asking you this is because, as you said, um, the right is definitely better organized to position itself to take advantage of this uh, of this juncture. Uh, it's it's very evident in um, the regimes that are in power, but at the same time, um, as much as forty seven percent of the voting population voted for Trump, a larger percentage did vote did not vote for him. So there is clearly a public will. But, um, and then I'm thinking about what's happening in Chile, for instance, or the protests that uh, are happening in Thailand or Hong Kong, uh, and even in India in, you know, in, in the face of this very regressive right-wing regime, um, there is a, some sort of a resurgence of uh, left-wing parties in, at least in pockets of India in the very last election that happened in India. It was quite interesting to see uh, that the, the left actually managed to increase its share of votes and seats. So my question to you is that, do you see any sort of, uh, sort of examples of hope that the, uh, the prospects of the left organizing itself uh, are, um, you know, essentially I'm asking you to give us some hope. <laughs> but do you see those prospects uh, around the world, if not in North America and Europe? Well, certainly, uh, having you know been in in Thailand over the last uh, you know seven months, I just got back to the Philippines, uh, and I couldn't come back because you know of the COVID restrictions on travel. One of the benefits that my being stranded there gave was to observe, you know, how this student-led movement, um, you know, that begun four years ago with just a few brave souls that uh, were defying the restrictions on, uh, 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 on mentioning any negative thing about the king um, has now become uh, a mass movement. And uh, I think the, the example of Thailand shows, you know, that, um, Examples are very important. And the people who went into exile, the people who dared to defy and were then um, uh, imprisoned, uh, the people that um, had to escape but then were hunted down by the military regime in neighboring countries, uh, the daring um, you know, to stand up, uh, I think, and, and plus the fact that, you know, you had millions of people, um, millions of young people that reached maturity over the last six years since the military coup, and therefore being less bound by the ideas of their parents, were able to translate a very simple idea of, we want democracy. Uh, into a mass movement that now confronts the regime with a terrible crisis. And, um, uh, and I think there's no um, going back here. So I think Thailand, I think represents three things. One is carriage, an individual example. Uh, second is, you know, the, the idea of democracy and it's not just political democracy, but people really want a real social democracy uh, in the sense of extending democratic rights to the economic sphere. And third, a new generation. Uh, I think those are coming together. And I feel that from what I know about Chile, and I did my dissertation on the counter-revolutionary uh, opposition to the Allende period um, uh, so that I have some knowledge of the dynamics in Chile. I think the same thing is operating, particularly the generational factor. Um, and 
so so basically I, I I think that you know you know the generational factor is going to be extremely is going to be extremely important when we talk about alternatives beyond ideas um, uh, beyond just formulating ideas, um, the generational factor and the ability to be able to, in the carriage, as well as the ability to be able to inspire large numbers of people, I, I think that is uh, going to be extremely important. Again, and, and I re, uh, and, and, uh, uh, in the Philippines, for instance, I think it's just a matter of time uh, before we see the youth breaking out in protests against the uh, current uh, uh, Duterte uh, regime. So I think it is in those factors that I would find, you know, some hope. So um, I would say, you know, that um, th that therefore we do have examples that can be very inspiring to us uh, that are emerging in different parts of the world. Um, nevertheless, you know, having those examples, of course, should not blind us to the fact that, you know, in each of these experiences, uh, whether it's in Thailand or in Chile, it took years of really carriage and organizing and facing up to the authorities that you know resulted uh, in the blooming of these movements uh, at this point so you know i think those are the main lessons that uh, you know we have so if you ask me i, I know it's really difficult uh, at this point in time and the right is much better organized um, but Nevertheless, you know, I, I would say that when we're just about to tip over into the abyss of despair, boom, the dynamics of real uh, change um, emerge, you know, uh, and, and, and serve to, 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 um, to uh, strengthen us all, you know. Uh, certainly, I, I think the, you know, the, the movement uh, in the United States against uh, the police led by Black Lives Matter. Um, uh, I think that, you know, it, it's also one of those, you know, those spontaneous, well, not, not spontaneous because people had been working for it in years, but is one of those, you know, um, events, you know, that uh, give you a lot of hope. And uh, I think the mobilization that took place uh, by largely progressive forces um, uh, really inspired and motivated so many uh, of the minorities to vote because, you know, it was the minorities, it was the minority vote, you know, that dumped Trump, okay? Uh, uh, and 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 without the organizing that was done by the broad left, I don't. I think we might have had a different kind of um, um, situation emerge in the U.S. elections at this point. Great, thank you. Um, I think what we we'll do is we have two questions. Uh, so first, Angela Wilson, and then Andy. You can go after Angela. So Angela. Thanks, Ken. Um, thank you, Dr. Bello, for your uh, talk. A couple of, just a quick comment. I remember being one young once and going to protests uh, about just over 20 years ago. Um, I didn't go to Seattle, but uh, I came close. And uh, and I feel like the um, the progressive movies, uh, movements of the 19. 90s was definitely uh, on its way and I felt like it was hijacked uh, probably poor word but in 9-11 because of 9-11 and uh, then seeing what's happened now and and the concern that, that the progressive movement that was really building uh, in part as a and I just look at the states for example the backlash 
and the build up with the 2018 midterm elections and how they uh, they seem to have a movement and then um, it's kind of faltered again, but um, we'll see if that, how that plays out with the, the pandemic as a whole. I mean, there's been some hopeful signs uh, as we've talked about, um, but I guess one of the, the questions I had, um, I follow a lot of the alt-right movements and I've been seeing a lot about the conspiracies. We have QAnon and, and everything else. And now they're obsessed with the great recess, uh, reset. And one of my questions is how do you see the World Economic Forum's Great Reset playing out over the next little while? And how do you think that is going to uh, either hinder or appeal to progressive politics over the next few years? Uh, yeah, Angela, could you just, you know, you know, I haven't really followed the World Economic Forum. Yeah. Uh, in terms of its great reset, but can you just give me some of the details on that? Because well, that's I, I, <laughs> something you I might just say. focus on the United States recently that you know something might have passed me by. Um, I think it's just something that they've talked about. Is the con like one of the comments on their site was the economic, political, and social disruption of COVID how it's uh, fundamentally changing the traditional context for decision-making. Um, I don't know much about it. It's been coming <laughs> up more as a, uh, I'm seeing this in uh, reaction to uh, a lot of Trudeau's, um, Trudeau's views. Like he, he made a comment or a slip of a, the tongue that sounded like he was in, um, embracing it. Um, I, I guess maybe then, maybe switching to more about the use of um, the right being able to latch on more to the <coughs> in in a way to help promote their views. Um, I know that was some of the concerns in the Filipino uh, presidential election. Um, I heard that there was some talk around that, uh, that your, your, your now president um, had promoted some conspiracy theories. And then just, I guess, in context with China and, and I mean, seeing the way people have blamed, uh, the way people have talked about the virus in China might be a better thing to comment on then. Oh, yes. Uh, well, I mean, the the um, in terms of the World Economic Forum, I think uh, I, I think that you know it's always been this forum uh, for bringing together uh, uh, you know establishment leaders as well as the corporate world and the financial world, and I think that for a long time they had this smugness you know, that globalization was going to just keep rolling along. And, um, you know, and then that was disrupted by the global financial crisis uh, and gave them second thoughts. And then of course, uh, Xi Jinping came in 2017 and said, well, now that the US has given up, uh, on globalization, we're going to be the leaders from now on. And as I said, you know, it was the whole rhetoric around connectivity. Uh, so that sort of um, that sort of became, uh, you know, a lot of the talking points uh, in the World Economic Forum for a while. You know, the passing of the torch to China, and then now, of course, there is you know COVID nineteen. Um, and, you know, that, um, you know, uh, and uh, a, a kind of organization like the World Economic Forum uh, to be credible, even to its members, some, must somehow address the uh, crisis of globalization and neoliberalism and, you know, try to, you know, reformulate things, you know, so that you know, um, um, you know, you 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 basically have the global power structure 
seem to be um, appear to be more humane or less inhuman than it really is you know so but that sort of ideological the, the ideological role of the wef for the global establishment i think has been you know very very important uh, uh, because you know unless you have active ideological innovation um you know institutions you know could or a system uh, in fact could could fall apart and i think the wef kind of uh, uh, says this as far as conspiracy theories are um concerned i think well we you know that uh, the goal the global right is full of conspiracy theories, okay, uh, and uh, QAnon, and you know, and uh, you know, the latest, of course, was was Trump saying that the the elections were stolen by big tech and uh, high finance. Okay, so this sort of uh, anti Wall Street. Uh, anti Google and company rhetoric that that fires up his base and say that there was really you know you know this 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 conspiracy and uh, you know but I I guess the uh, I guess we should just expect that conspiracy theories will keep on coming from the right. Um, because precisely those, those folks will never be convinced by the real news, but will always try to reformulate reality to fit their needs. But of course, it can become quite absurd as when Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, uh, said that Hugo Chavez, who has been dead for seven years, had a role in stealing the elections. And, and so, you know, sometimes they just go too far that they just, you know, discredit themselves. Um, but there are conspiracy theories that do, don't go that far, but certainly, um, um, you know, would be a bit more influential than those that go over uh, the edge. Um, and um, but what you're seeing right now, especially in the U.S., which you know, you know, is especially with the president that generates one's cons conspiracy theory every moment. Um, what you see, what you're seeing right now in terms of the far right politics, is what one political scientist, um, um, uh, I think it was Richard Hofstadter, historian called the paranoid style in American politics. So this has, this has always been there, <laughs> you know, this in the far right, the, you know, there has been this paranoia that, that spins conspiracy theories. Um, and uh, so, and, and we'll continue to spin conspiracy theories, you know, uh, so um, of course well, on the left, sometimes there are um, also, uh, sort of um, conspiracy theories uh, about who's managing events. Um, but I don't think that they're taken as seriously uh, as they're taken uh, on the right. Uh, thanks, so Walden. So I thank you so much for that. Um, thanks, Angela, for the question. And I just I know in, in, the, in the interest of time, and I know Andy's got a question that he's just burned to ask. So I wanted to make sure he, we have time for some more questions. So Andy. Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Be Dr. Bello. I, I really enjoyed your talk. And, and one of the things that is refreshing to me uh, listening to you is uh, your ability to sort of to stay away from simply current events history and to look at the longer durée, I think a Bordellian approach would be more, more your style of, of looking at the, at the world and how things are changing. And I want to ask a question about um, two people that you mentioned in your talk, 
and that's Joseph uh, Stiglitz and Paul Krugman, uh, both of whom I think um, suffer from the fetishism of trying to sort of re rehabilitate and resuscitate neoliberalism. Uh, even, at, even at the same time, they are uh, uh, concerned about the fact that um, uh, some of the things that they said about globalization um, were, were, were not true. And I think we've seen they, them make a few statements in that regard. But looking at the, in terms of the long durée, I mean, I think what people are missing by focusing too heavily on, on the US elections and the, and the United States um, is the fact that the global order, the world order is shifting. Uh, it's shifting in ways that the US has no control over anymore. Um, you know, it used to be a time when global hegemons controlled the ideas and the institutions and had the material capabilities to support uh, the, the, the formation of world order. And it seems to me that Robert Cox was probably right when he said that we were moving to an era uh, of, of non-hegemonic world order in which no, no major power, no, no major power would want to even become the next hegemon. Uh, and I, I raise this question with you because you, you raised the issue of China and the Belt and Road Initiative and the fact that this has really gone global now. Do you see China um, as wanting to, to take on the, the mantle of a global hegemonic power in order to shape world order according to its own image, um, in order to shape the ideas that will govern world order, that the foundation of world order, in building new institutions that will counter the IMF and the World Bank, um, that would bring in uh, the, the kind of wealth and material capability to support those institutions and to support the, its own idea of how the world should be governed. Well, um, Andy, the short answer is no. I don't think that China has um, has um, any intention of um, replacing the United States uh, as a hegemon uh, for several reasons. I think you know that um, to a great extent, its um, reactions really have been of a very defensive kind, which is, uh, you know, they have a political economy that, as you know, has, the state has played a very active role. And um, they feel that that has been responsible for their emergence as, uh, as you know, a, a significant economic power. And that the United States, uh, both Republicans and Democrats have, you know, dumped on this model of theirs. And to some extent that explains the defensiveness that uh, with which they have responded to criticisms about uh, China. Uh, I, uh, the second thing that uh, 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 I, I would say is that um, um, again, um, taking on from your previous comments um, and from what um, what thinkers in you know the um, the world order um, e e e uh, world systems analysis have have said is that. What are important are the, the the relations of production globally, and what happens is you know there are shifting centers of accumulation that that occur you know, um, and uh, it does seem as if um, you know the you know the emergence of China is 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 really you know you know part of. Uh, uh, you know, shifting centers of accumulation in, you know, the global economy. And uh, so I would just like to say that, um, you know, that in a way, um, China does, you know, uh, China is 
is is uh, is um, is a sign of global capitalism's uh, need, you know, to be able to revive or reinvigorate itself, you know. Um, so, um, you know, and 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 so I think that's less intentions of the Chinese elite about imposing themselves on the rest of the world than the dynamics of global capital. The third thing is, um, you know, the Chinese um, military uh, is so puny compared to the United States. Uh, and they have really made no efforts to even match the United States here. You know, the, the uh, defense expenditure the U.S. spends uh, three times more than China. Uh, the uh, strategic defense capabilities of China are, are so far behind the United States. The conventional military deployment abilities of China are so weak at this point. They have two Soviet era aircraft carriers and the United States has all these super modern 15 task air carrier task forces that are uh, uh, there. And even the Pentagon admits that the strategic posture of the Chinese is strategic defense because they are so worried about this U.S. Uh, operative doctrine called air sea doctrine, uh, you know, that is meant to penetrate Chinese defenses and destroy their capabilities in southeastern China in the event of conflict. So these are just some of the reasons why I think that um, this idea that China is about to take over as a global hegemon is, is, you know, does not have any real basis. And of course, I must say that if you ask me, the Belt and Road Initiative is not a blueprint for global hegemony. It's an effort to export the surplus capacity of of, of Chinese industry, because this is really hampering any kind of rise of profitability, this surplus capacity of Chinese industry. And even the Chinese themselves admit that this is motivated by an effort to, to export their surplus capacity rather than, you know, rather than anything else, you know. So, but, you know, so China, <laughs> Has its own contradictions and limitations, and I would tend to think, you know, that um, if we take the defensiveness into account, I, I think that Robert Cox may very well be right that this is an era where nobody would want to take the role of a global hegemon. Great, thank you, thanks, Andy. So we have time, um, we have about 10 minutes left in our session and we have time for some more questions. And I see that uh, Zore has a question. Go ahead, Zore. Or has her hand up. I think you're on mute. Yes, hi. Um, so my question is a follow up on this last question about um, China and a potential new world order. And um, I'm just wondering, um, I mean, going back to Wallerstein and what he says about um, uh, who becomes a hegemon in the world. And when you think about it, okay, so it's a major land power and air power and agricultural and industrial power and this and that. And I was thinking all of these really pertain to an and kind of analog world. And for today, for anyone to become hegemon, you don't need, you know, big tanks and aircraft carriers and, you know, a huge Navy. And so I'm kind of not surprised that China is not investing in these big, heavy, you know, old things. They are probably, if they are thinking of hegemony is probably hegemony for a digital world. 
which then means then it makes sense to think about, for instance, what's going on with um, Huawei and uh, some of these other scandals that China has been involved in, in terms of um, um, trying to flex their digital muscles much more than their uh, military muscles. That was my kind of question comment. <laughs> I like your reaction to that. Well, the well, I think that the the East Asian developmental model that you know began with Japan and you know was also followed by Taiwan and and Korea and then the Southeast Asian countries, and then China, uh, I think there was always a very great concern about being deprived of knowledge. And that if you look at the investment uh, loss of so many of these countries, there just, it was very important for them to assure technology transfer. Uh, and it was um, whether through uh, um, technology transfer that was not permitted <laughs> or technology transfer that, you know, uh, was uh, the price of having uh, a Western corporations operate in the country. It's not surprising that, you know, this has been a major concern. Um, and I think that the defensive concern here is that um, what the Chinese and you know generally throughout East Asia think is, you know, that they should have access to the universal knowledge commons, is you know being unfairly uh, limited through intellectual property rights legislation and everything else. And and I think that that China's concern about its the digital future is very much the concern of everybody else in the global south about our digital future. Darn it, you know. Uh, so, so to then ex say that that is basically a, um, an effort to exercise digital hegemony in the world. I I think that if one looks at where the South has been coming from. And one of the things that we all have been fighting are these free trade agreements that limit uh, our access to intellectual property. So, you know, as far as we're concerned, China is doing the right thing in basically protecting and making sure that it does not, you know, it, it's not cornered into a position where uh, its digital capabilities and their development are hampered by very coercive attempts on the part of, you know, advanced uh, countries like the United States. So, um, I think that that if one looks at it from this perspective of the global South, you know, I, I'm all in support of what China is doing in order to preserve its access to the universal knowledge commons or what should be the universal knowledge commons. And I don't think that we can attribute that to a demand for digital uh, 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 hegemony. The other thing of course is um, whether we like it or not, um, the Pentagon really defines China as a strategic rival. And the, the, the Chinese take very seriously the fact that they're surrounded by hundreds of US military bases. And with a very aggressive war fighting doctrine. And I, you know, and, and I think that this aggressiveness on the part of the Pentagon is, is not going to be hemmed in by the Biden administration. Uh, because in the Asia Pacific, um, uh, 
uh, far more than any other place globally, the Pentagon has a relatively great degree of independence in terms of military planning. That's why we really get worried. And, and you know, when I was in Vietnam, uh, when I was still in parliament, we would meet regularly with the Vietnamese and you know, they said, you know, what you have in this area right now, the South China Sea is unregulated, no rules of engagement. So that even just a ship collision could escalate into a major conventional war. What you have is a balance of power kind of um, uh, regulation uh, but then we all know what unregulated balance of power leads to, like the First World War in in Europe. So I would not I would not underestimate the uh, the fact that I mean the possibility, you know, that conflict could in fact break out in the East and South China Seas because, you know, you you have such um, uh, unregulated kind of chicken games going on uh, between the United States and China. So, so I, would, I would say don't underestimate the military dimension because it makes a big difference. And I think this is where the Chinese are really running scared at this point, which is why they commit all sorts of blunders uh, by, for instance, declaring the South China Sea as 90% theirs and that sort of thing, which is very unjust to the rest of us in the in the South China Sea. But at the same time, we can understand where they're coming from because uh, they're hemmed in by U.S. power on all sides. Um, you know, that's that's uh, that's that's just a reality. Thank you, Walt. Um, so we're. We're coming down to the last few minutes of uh, Walden's talk, but I want to give anyone else a chance that might have a question, um, a last question you might want to ask. I don't see anything in the uh, chat and I don't see any hands raised. Any Anyone else want to maybe ask a question before we wind this down? Okay, um, so with that, I would just like to thank you, Walden, for uh, your wonderful talk on a, a very wide ranging but very specific um, talk on a number of issues that relate a lot to the, the rise of new forms of globalization and, and the neoliberal right, and, and even how you brought it back to, I think, our theme topic, and that is um, this idea of, of, of living in this, in this period of COVID and how you know zoonosis can you know increasingly occur with the opening up of the Belt and Road Initiative and other events like that. So I think that you know even though it was wide ranging, you were very specific, and I really appreciate that. And I think it's a, a great start to our speaker series this year. And so with that, I'd like to first of all thank all of you for coming out. And I think this would be the time when I'd say drive safely home, but I guess that's not the case because everyone is home, which is a, a, a safe thing. But thanks everyone for taking the time, especially this evening, just recognizing that it's a huge time difference of 18 hours. So, you know, um, I really do appreciate you coming out in the evening for, for Walden's talk and of course Walden for being able to make it. So um, I just want to finally just thank Walden, uh, Dr. Walden Bello for, um, for his talk today and uh, agreeing to be part of our speaker series. So I can clap and say thank you. And I think everyone else has different ways of, in, of joining me and thanking you. Thank you. Thank you. Too, and there are a number of expressions of yeah. thanks as well in the chat, uh, Dr. Bello. They're pouring in to say thank you very much for the for yeah. the talk and to Ken for organizing. So just one thing before everyone leaves, I just want to remind you that um, the talk is recorded, so there'll be access to it on our Department of Sociology website. And then we're going to further explore this topic in our speaker series on January 21st, when Dr. Leila Harris from UBC will be joining us for her talk. So once again, um, thank you all for coming and, and thanks Walden for taking the time. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone.